Good morning, good uh, afternoon, good evening to our distinguished guests and viewers around the world. I'm Marco Battaglia, Head of Communications and Engagement at CDP. I welcome to the thematic session led by the European Commission, titled, as you can see on the screen, Sustainable Finance to Leave No One Behind. And to start, let me welcome Jutta Urpilainen, connected online as a European Commissioner for International Partnerships. Uh, Jutta Urpilainen oversees the Commission's work on international cooperation and sustainable development. Uh, previously, she was the Minister of Finance of Finland from 2011 to 2014. Mrs. Urpilainen, I'll let you the scene to share with us uh, EU priorities and the role of sustainable finance to leave no, no one behind. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to today's high-level panel, Sustainable Finance to Leave No One Behind. The pandemic has exposed, like X-ray, the world's inequalities. It's putting at risk decades of progress in terms of poverty, health, education, and leaving the most vulnerable further behind. The Sustainable Development Goals are further away from us. At the same time, the pandemic has also spurred in innovations in public policy and financing tools. Today, the world has a historic opportunity to build back better. Together, we can reduce inequalities and foster a green digital fair and resilient global recovery. Financing the sustainable development goals in the last decade for action will require huge efforts. Public finance is essential, but unfortunately not enough. Sustainable finance is an important part of the solution. Financial instruments linked to sustainability can help significantly in mobilizing private finance in support of the SDGs. Given the size of the challenge, we need to work together with public development banks who have a major role to play. We are striving as Team Europe to achieve greater synergies within our financial architecture for development to achieve bigger impact on the ground. Dear friends, the EU has also developed a powerful risk sharing tool, the European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus. Over the next seven years, our 40 billion euros guarantee will attract private investments towards sustainable projects. This could leverage over 200 billion euros in private investments. This means investments in sustainable energy, agriculture, human capital, smart cities and digitalization. It will help our partners recover from the pandemic, create sustainable jobs and boost their economies. The EU has been a front runner on sustainable finance. We strongly support the G20's focus on financing for sustainable development to address the recovery. We are also building a sustainable finance strategy for low and middle income countries to achieve transformational impact on the ground. Dear friends, we must also make sure that all our efforts emphasize inclusion by offering opportunities to the most vulnerable. The rural farming communities are often marginalized. The EU has tailored several programs to help small-scale farmers in gain access to better financial products and tools. Thanks to our support, a dairy company in Senegal has developed an application to pay herders living in remote areas. Thanks to our support, African women and youth are starting their own businesses 
in green and digital sectors. In Fiji, green bonds are helped channel investments towards flood management in sugarcane sugar fields and helped rebuild schools with, to withstand weather. This is the kind of innovative thinking we need in order to reach vulnerable populations with sustainable, sustainable finance. We have the momentum right now. As the world continues to respond to the pandemic, we must seize the opportunity of fi sustainable finance to address inequalities. The support of the G20 is a major step that I hope will continue for future finance in common gatherings. With these thoughts, I look forward to hearing inspiring exchanges today. Thanks to Jutta Ulpilainen. Uh, now let's move on with the global panel with different speakers from all over the world. Uh, we'll start with a video message from uh, Amadou Hot, Minister of Economy, Planning and International Cooperation of Senegal. Uh, as, as Minister of Economy of Senegal, Mr. Hot has a great overview on how African countries are tackling sustainability issues while at the same time ensuring their economic development. Furthermore, Senegal is a member of the International Platform on Sustainable Finance, a multi-stakeholder forum aimed uh, at increasing private sustainable investments. Madam Yulpilainen of the European Commission, honorable panelists, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, I first would like to express my regret for not attending this panel live with you all due to my required presence at cabinet meeting at this stage. I'm delighted for the opportunity to speak at this higher level session on sustainable finance to leave no one behind. And I send my congratulations to the European Commission for organizing this panel at such an opportune time. The COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized more than ever the need for greater coordination among financial institutions, governments, and the private sector in order to build a cohesive financial system that provides equal opportunities for developed and developing countries to finance sustainably their economies. As the COVID-19 pandemic has persisted, the economic inequalities between developed and developing countries have continued to grow with differing vaccine acquisition and financing strategies, abilities to use monetary policy to inject the necessary liquidity in the system and financing terms as well as conditions that oftentimes do not match the project's realities. Against this backdrop, I propose two ways in which we can craft this ideal financial system that will enable the proliferation of private capital flows towards developing nations. The first is to ensure the ability to finance the structural transformation of developing economies, particularly in Africa. Against this backdrop, I would propose two ways in which we can craft this ideal financial system that will enable the proliferation of private capital flows towards developing countries. The first is to ensure the ability to finance the structural transformation of developing economies, particularly in Africa. This implies the ability to provide concessional terms and conditions that matches the asset life and expand the sector's eligibility for such a concessional financing. Export finance, or what we call export credit, alongside commercial loans and MDB financing, have also been used by our country to accompany Senegal's structural transformation 
and for the Sustainable Development Goals. However, such an instrument still comes with several constraints in terms of processes, the content of commercial contracts, the overall higher cost, considering the premium to be paid, the interest rate, and the government's contribution that is required, which is usually funded with expensive commercial credits. Also, the maturities imposed by OECD rules can be quite short compared to the lifetime of the assets to be financed. Channeling more ECA's funds to finance the achievement of SDGs will require a more creative approach with the ability to adapt the product to the needs of our countries. Ways of making such a financing more attractive are to extend the maturities to 30 years or 40 years at an interest rate below 1%. This will allow to fund important rail projects, for example, whose economic benefits are not felt for the first one to two decades after construction. Or to fund the empowerment, for example, of women and youth through rural and urban microfinance institutions or instruments set up by the state, such as the Delegation for Rapid Entrepreneurship in Senegal. This brings me to the point regarding eligible sectors. Infrastructure and energy are the backbones of our economies. In Senegal, we have ambitious roads and rail projects, as well as gas to power projects to enable us to become a middle income country by 2035, as stated in our emerging Senegal plan. But to make this, uh, this vision a reality, we need such sectors with long-term assets to benefit from long-term concessional financing. Building out infrastructure will naturally increase the private sector capital flow into our economies. But to make this vision a reality, we need such sectors with long-term assets to benefit from long-term concessional financing. Building our infrastructure will naturally increase the attractiveness to our economies to, to the private sector. In Senegal, for example, 39% of the financing of our economic recovery plan will come from the private sector. But effectively mobilizing this piece of financing we require a strong public investment in a sustainable manner in relation to the SDGs to already equip the private investors with the backbone necessary to generate financial and social returns. The second idea to invest in structural reforms to increase our competitiveness. In the case of Senegal, we have recently revamped our PPP law which will attract international capital and expertise to carry out our critical projects. We are also creating a fund that will provide financing to structure projects in order to de-risk them and thereby providing more attractive and more predictable returns for investors. The COVID-19 pandemic has reminded everyone of the need to work together to solve a global problem. Financing has long been a powerful tool to respond to global crises. Let us collectively embark on this new paradigm shift and provide access to finance in a more equal manner and in a more equitable manner, I would say. The allocation of SDRs is a good step forward. And now we need the SDR's reallocation to provide more resources for vaccine production, vaccine acquisition, and for the economic recovery needed to leave no one behind. Thank you for your kind attention. So thanks to Minister Hart uh, to go on. I welcome uh, Sri Muliani Indrawati, Minister of Finance of Indonesia, 
connected online. So, Minister, I have two questions for you. The first one, uh, what are the measures that Indonesia is taking in uh, developing local sustainable finance uh, frameworks? And the second, what is your perspective on the role of G20 in defining and impacting global standards for sustainable finance and ensuring attention to financing needs of low and middle income countries? Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to participate in this important forum. The first question regarding what is the measure uh, that we are developing for sustainable finance framework. Indonesia has the commitment, according to the Paris Agreement, to reduce our CO2 emission by 29% with our own resources and by 41% with international support. The commitment will cost 365 billion for our own uh, uh, resources, as well as 479 billion with the international support. We first, of course, using our own tools, that is fiscal tool, in which we develop budget tagging, which is dedicated for climate. 4.1% of our spending related to the climate change. And this only uh, uh, fulfills 34% of the funding. We use also instrument policy on the fiscal side, like tax allowance, tax holiday, as well as VAT, in order for us to be able to provide more incentive uh, financing, especially for climate change project, including renewable energy. We also, in this case, develop green bond as financing instrument with whether this is issued globally as well as domestically. Our global green bond since 2018 up to 2020 has been issued with a total amount of 3.5 billion US dollar. And our retail domestic green bonds at the amount of 490 million US dollar. This green bond uh, finance for er five area that is renewable energy, energy efficiency, improving climate resilience for vulnerable areas, as well as creating sustainable transportation and waste management. With this green bond, we, were, we are able to reduce 10.3 million tons CO2 equivalent GHG emission. We also, in this case, issue SDG Bonds. This is just recently issued with the Euro 500 million with 1.35% interest, which is very competitive. The SDG bond is for social and environmental services improvement. But if we use only public funds, definitely will not adequate to funding sustainable finance how we can attract and create catalytic role for private sector participation, which is required uh, around 40 to 55% of financing gap. This is at the amount of 148 billion up to 263 billion US dollar. First, we created a platform for blended finance in which public, private, philanthropic, as well as multilateral institution funding can be blended in order for us to be able to finance sustainable uh, projects, sustainable finance projects. We also start introducing within our legislation carbon pricing and carbon tax, including establishing piloting on a carbon market. With result-based payment, this will also creating uh, a financing for many of the sustainable projects. We also working with financial sector regulator or authority in order for us to be able to integrate sustainable finance and ESG, uh, including climate risk within the work program of financial industries. The, we also creating financial instrument and developing financial instrument within capital market this is uh, re, uh, including sustainable link bond, green index, carbon trading. We also move from self-defined green towards standardized definition and reporting. This is to make sure that there will be credibility and reliability of all what we call it claim on a green project 
so there will be no greenwashing. With the Financial Sector Authority, we are also developing green taxonomy to guide developing financing products and services. On your second, related to uh, this uh, financing, there are still a lot of challenges facing by country like Indonesia who show a very strong commitment. How we are going to be able to integrate risk management, corporate governance and bank rating with this long-term climate change uh, commitment. Strong cooperation and coordination across sectoral will be very important and establishing credible measurable process is going to be very critical. We also notice there is still market value in uh, creating an advantage for financial instrument related to the green project. For example, our issue on the green bonds, whether globally as well as domestically, they are not creating obvious benefit in the form of lower yield while the compliant costs to issue green bonds is actually very demanding and high. So there is no really advantage of in, uh, instrument like green who can be reflected in a better price or lower yield. On your second uh, question related to the G20 role, Indonesia is going to chair G20 starting this December. And uh, G20 is going to be very critical in defining standard and impacting standard, especially for the low and um, middle income country. The question is, of course, for many low and middle income country, as we heard from our colleague from Senegal, the ability to deliver climate change commitment, while at the same time, the need for development still continue very, very demanding will definitely require financing sources and technology access. So how we are going to be able within this G20 creating a standard that will not prevent further for low income country and middle income country to be able to deliver their commitment on climate change and continue uh, uh, commit as well as furthering their development process. Transition toward green growth, definitely very important, but this needs to be affordable and just. One of the ideas that Indonesia now developing is creating energy transition mechanism in which we are going to create a funding coming from also multilateral development bank like ADB combined with other sources to retire earlier fossil fuel like coal-based power uh, plant with the renewable. This will require funding for retiring, those which is more polluted, and funding for creating project which is based on renewable. But this will also require a lot of work regarding the pricing. On the G20 sustainable, we create sustainable finance working group. Sustainable finance working group will formulate concrete action through developing enabling environment that would mobilize international financing. G20 Sustainable Working Group will make, uh, it's already made significant progress and we do hope under our presidency, we will be able to continue creating a forward looking common view and priority for scaling up sustainable finance, especially supporting for low and uh, middle income country with the need to achieve the, G, uh, the 2030 agenda and the goals uh, of the Paris Agreement. We also continue and oversee the roadmap for the next G20 presidency 2020, 2020 so that we are going to be able to make progress on sustainable financial transition which is supposed to be affordable and just. We also recognize and reflect various gaps and barriers between countries, while also recommending different strategies and timeline for implementing important measures across the country. Together with Finnish Ministry of Finance, I chairing the Coalition of Finance Minister for Climate Action. 
this coalition will serve as a platform for uh, supporting collective effort of member countries, especially finance minister, in utilizing fiscal policy, public finance management, and climate finance mobilization to encourage domestic as well as global climate change action. This coalition will ex exchange experiences and information related to fiscal and economic policies correlated with climate change. For example, how we can introduce carbon pricing, green budgeting, and mobilizing private sources of climate finance. The principle is also guided by the Helsinki principle number six, in which aspirational and non-binding principle that will promote uh, national climate action. Indonesia is going to also chair ASEAN and within this uh, platform, we developing within ASEAN country taxonomy of sustainable finance. This is our effort in order for us to be able to promote sustainable finance in the region by focusing on four pillars or aspect that is policy, coordination, awareness, and education, including also examining the demand and supply side. This taxonomy will serve ASEAN member country a common language for sustainable finance and account for international goals and ASEAN specific needs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Indrawati. Uh, we welcome now uh, the next speaker connected online, Pavan Sukdev, President of WWF International. From a, a major NGO perspective, uh, President uh, Sukdev, how do you see the impact of em env environmental, uh, social and governance uh, subjects on finance? And how can we make sure that no one is left behind in our efforts to achieve the climate goals? Uh, thank you for inviting me and a pleasure to be with this uh, uh, very expert and, and senior group. I would um, like to reply to these two separate questions. One is on, uh, I would say, ESG, environmental, social and governance factors. Um, firstly, uh, with pay, by paying tribute to the UNGC and the IFC, the UN Global Compact and IFC launched way back in 2004, a conference entitled Who Cares Wins? And uh, the term ESG was born out of the paper that was published by that conference. It has, of course, now become a buzzword, a byword, if you like, for what is known as impact investing. But despite the many and inspiring stories of impact investing, I'd like to point out that there's another side to this coin because the total estimated volume of impact investing is still under a trillion dollars. And uh, in other words, it's really only a tiny fraction uh, um, of the total uh, investing investment universe. Um, we need to also worry about not just impact investing, but investment impact. Investment impact means what is the impact of our portfolios? And many of these are passive portfolios uh, on society and nature. And the solution there is to look at um, the externalities of these portfolios and the externalities of the investees that comprise these portfolios. Um, so there is no escaping the reality that when we look at the planetary boundaries, two thirds of the economy and jobs are private sector and roughly two thirds of the impacts on planetary boundaries, whether it is biodiversity or ecosystem degradation or climate change or ocean acidification and so on and so on. A lot of the impacts are also being delivered by the activities of the private sector and ensuring that uh, negative externalities are held in check and positive externalities conversely are, are promoted and supported by policies and mechanisms, I think is part of the, the solution. Um, so yes, it is important for us in terms of environmental, social and governance uh, awareness to encourage it and to promote uh, impact investing. But at the same time, I would say it is probably more important for us to focus on the negative natural capital externalities of the private sector, 
and ensure that as policymakers, we create the frameworks and the mechanisms which enable a standardized approach towards measurement and disclosure of these externalities, which will then in turn drive information and action by policy, subsidies and investments in the right sectors and withholding and checking subsidies towards, for example, um, the estimated $5 trillion of de facto subsidies for still climate changing industries and basically fossil fuels. And that's an estimate from the IMF itself in terms of the total subsidies and the negative externalities of GAG emissions of fossil fuels. So that is my, my uh, feedback on the first question. And on your second question, I think probably equally important to recognize that if we want truly to leave no one behind, we have to worry about who are the workers in the world. And the largest employer in the world today is actually the agricultural and food system sector, right? Food and agriculture employs more than 1.5 billion people. And out of that, more than a billion are actually employed in small farms, which means less than two hectares. And there's more than a billion people in small farms. So the question we have to address is that recognizing that food systems are, according to some estimates, 44 to 57% of greenhouse gas emissions, if you account for the value chain, in other words, not just the 23, 24% that is happening on farms, but if you account for the deforestation that takes place to produce the beef, the soya, and, and the um, and the palm oil, if you account for the emissions on farms, if you account for the, the transportation, the huge amount of transportation globally, that is actually food transportation. And finally, if you account for the one third of food that is unfortunately still wasted on average and the GHG emissions from there, around half roughly of global emissions, GHG emissions are coming from food systems. Now, there's a link because Today's food systems, typically the conventional food systems, are what I would call high impact on nature, nature and low dependency on nature. But the small farmers that I'm trying to, to argue for, those small farmers have food systems and, and agricultural systems where, in fact, they have low, typically low impacts on nature, but very high dependency on nature. So they suffer the most if and when food systems are, are disrupted and if and when climate is disrupted. Ensuring resilience for small farms against greenhouse gas emissions means changing these food systems. And there are amazing examples. I'll give you just one because of time constraints. One great example is in my country, in India, in Andhra Pradesh state, uh, a project which is a collaborative project between the local government, the national government, uh, private sector, uh, Wipro actually their foundation. And of course, most importantly, the communities, the local communities led by women. This is, a, this is a project that is led by and steered by the SHGs, the self-help groups that were originally created for microfinance in that state. They have begun a huge transformation in food systems. As of now, 700,000 farmers have started the transition from conventional farming, which is basically chemical input dependent, into a farming which is totally natural product dependent. So there are zero chemicals being used. And the net result of that, which has been measured over the last five years, the net results of that is there is an increase in yield in everything from the base crops, that is rice and groundnuts, as well as fruit and vegetables and so on, an increase in yield. And in some cases, in case of chilies, for instance, and cash crops, yield is increasing 50-80%. A decrease in water usage, a decrease in GHG emissions from those farms, a decrease in negative health effects, both on farm and off farm. And I think one needs to look at things holistically and recognize that merely measuring per capita, uh, per, sorry, per capita productivity of farms or merely measuring per hectare productivity of farms is not a correct way of measuring food system performance. You have to account for all of the other very important dimensions of food systems, not least the billion jobs that are tied up in small farms. This, the policy drivers today that we put together across the governments around the world have to focus, in my opinion, on small farms in order to deliver all of the SDGs. If we focus on the resilience of small farms, their productivity on a sustainable basis, and pricing, in other words, equitable pricing and fair pricing. If we deliver these, then we will create greater income in the hands of poor farmers, which is a solution, a combined solution to poverty, to climate change, to water scarcity, and of course, to improved human health. So um, 
colleagues, I would encourage a focus on this elephant in the drawing room, which is absolutely crucial, in my opinion, to resolve the issue of leaving no one behind when we focus on financing. This is indeed the reason why we in WWF have a whole practice group, a practice community focused on food system, the food community, and they are extremely active together with all of you to hopefully, hopefully move uh, policy and mechanisms, incentives and disincentives towards the right direction to ensure um, sustainable finance, but most importantly, one that is equitable and leaves no one behind. Thank you. Thank you, President uh, Sukta, for your words. Uh, uh, the annual SDG financing gap in developing countries uh, has increased tremendously. Uh, to investigate this topic, I'll welcome Preeti Sinha, Executive Secretary of the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Um, I have two questions for you. Um, how can we attract capital and sustainable investments to the least developed countries? And uh, how does your organization promote sustainable finance to reach uh, people and companies that are most in need? Thank you. And on behalf of the United Nations, thank you for inviting us to this panel. And also at the UN Capital Development Fund that I represent, we are proud and privileged to serve the least of the developing countries. So in these few minutes, let's, let me tell you about what we do in terms of finance and investment into these countries. So the reason this topic is very interesting is our report on blended finance, which UNCDF did with OECD, shows that only 6% of mobilized private capital for blended finance goes to the LDCs. This is because the LDCs face numerous structural problems, structural transformation problems. They have productive capacity that needs to be worked upon. They have large, undiversified, informal economies and a shortage of financially viable projects. This is the normal perception. But we feel the LDCs also represent enormous untapped potential, and we work with them on all of these other challenges that I just uh, outlined. The young population, natural resources, increased South-South trade, increased North-South trade investments are some of the things that can really catalyze economic transformation and greater prosperity in these countries. In UNCDF's experience, we must do three things to attract capital to LDCs. First, we must deploy cat catalytic capital including blended finance, guarantees, and other risk, risk mitigation, de-risking measures to create a pipeline of investment-ready enterprises and facilitate their access to other sources of finance. Second, we must address the small size of the LDC transactions. We must aggregate the deals to create overall bigger ticket sizes. And such kind of portfolio diversification will then attract larger flows of public-private capital. And finally, we must help the countries develop their capital markets to recognize and reward both the economic and social value of investing in the LDCs. We've been taking some steps on these during our recent General Assembly. We also feel that we must increase the awareness that um, investing in the LDCs does not have to be synonymous with sacrificing returns. So we feel these economies do offer those opportunities. And there are a number of standards that can help investors recognize that sustainable development is at the core of long-term value creation. So in terms of investing in the SDGs, we have the UNDP SDG impact standard, the UNEP's principle for responsible banking, and the UN supported principles for responsible investment, to name a few. The key is to raise the awareness and operationalize such principles so that investors in the least developed countries are able to achieve environment and social impact alongside profits. In terms of your um, other question, I would be happy to get into how we promote sustainable finance. UNCDF has a sustainable investment track record and a pipeline of SDG compliant investments that demonstrate our capacity and potential for catalyt catalytic investments to unlock additional commercial and semi-commercial SDG finance. So our investment works on that so-called missing middle, the, the deals that are too big for microfinance and too small and too risky for other standard financial institutions. By supporting these missing middle and projects, this is the niche that we occupy in the development finance architecture. Our investments as well as our technical and policy support are aimed explicitly to leverage ODA resources that can help unlock additional private and public capital. We do this through three mechanisms. One is called the bridge facility, 
In our bridge facility, we deploy blended finance, including loans and guarantees to businesses and SDG aligned projects in the LDCs. We are targeting a capitalization of 50 million for this bridge facility, and we are partnering with the European Commission under that European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus. Second, we provide financial advice to governments and private sector on structuring and developing new innovative instruments and vehicles, included, including blended funds, bonds, and other capital market products. Thirdly, we have also launched third-party managed funds. These include the Build Fund for the LDC-based SMEs, which aims to mobilize 250 million, and an international municipal investment fund for municipal infrastructure, an equity fund targeting 350 million euros. Through all these channels, we are able to take capital to the last mile in these frontier markets, and we hope to create partnerships with you all for the LDCs and the SDGs. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, let's go ahead with uh, Soren Peter Andresen, CEO of the Association of European Development Finance Institutions. Uh, we have two questions for you as well. How do European DFIs deploy mechanisms that uh, help make sustainable investment in low and middle income countries more attractive for private investors? And the second question is, uh, how do you include in your actions the social aspects of tackling inequality and leaving no one behind? Thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be with this distinguished panel today and talk about the experience of development finance institutions in uh, making catalytic investments in the private sector. And to see, uh, to talk about how uh, the work of DFIs has become uh, critical critical part of strategies to achieve the sustainable development goals and uh, the Paris Agreement goals. From an optimistic perspective, I think it's, it's important for me to state that, um, that we have to understand that there is a high demand among private in institutional investors for sustainable investment opportunities in emerging and developing economies. The challenge is that these assets that are investable for, for these investors or these institutions are often in short supply. Uh, many institutional investors um, are looking for assets that are aligned with their sustainability and climate goals that they have increasingly committed to uh, and that are increasingly an important part of their strategies. But, but many of these investment opportunities or the assets that are available um, that meet these criteria are often associated with uh, other features and risks that are difficult for institutional investors to engage in. For instance, they are often early stage and involve uh, development and construction risk. They're low liquidity, meaning that they're hard to transfer in uh, capital markets. Um, and uh, they often have long tenors uh, on, on the debt side uh, or are perceived in some ways to be uh, subject to regulatory risks that, uh, that make institutional investors hesitate. So in short, the supply of sustainability linked bonds and public equities in emerging and developing markets um, is, is too limited uh, for us to reach our sustainable development goals at this time. And these challenges are in a sense to be expected because we are talking about major economic transformations, but we have to confront uh, the challenge uh, very much head on. And that's the job we try to do as DFIs by being first movers and helping speed up the creation of assets that are on the one hand uh, aligned with impact objectives of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, and at the same time accessible and attractive for private institutional investors. And DFIs use a variety of mechanisms to do this. One is to invest uh, risk capital and engage in early stages in crucial sectors like renewables, but also in other sectors that are traveling along their decarbonization uh, pathways and uh, need to involve more private investment, uh, but also to build expertise so that we can help ensure the quality of assets um, in these sectors so that they can become uh, investable uh, and assets with high integrity for private investors. We also have scaled up significantly partnerships with donor partners and governments um, to speed up our engagement in market development and risk sharing with private institutional investors. We are very proud of some of the um, partnerships that European development finance institutions have been able to develop uh, together with the European Commission to uh, to scale up uh, the use of EU guarantees and, and blended finance instruments, for instance, to, um, to scale up electrification 
uh, based on renewables and to increase incomes in agricultural supply chains. And we have a very exciting pipeline of further initiatives that, uh, that will come in this area. Um, we also need to engage with decision makers uh, to consider uh, policy innovations that can help unlock sustainable finance at greater scale uh, by reducing the general risks that uh, private investment is facing in these economies. But to your second question, um, there, there are also crucial um, uh, aspects to consider how uh, the push for more sustainable finance does not leave, uh, leave other groups behind or leave vulnerable um, and under-resourced uh, groups behind. Um, and I'd like just to make brief comments on, on, two, on this in, in two levels. So one is in the terms of the actual financing that we do as DFIs and where we try to mobilize private finance. There is definitely a risk that when we align our financing with the Paris Agreement uh, and take decisions like excluding fossil fuels, that, that some developing uh, countries will see this as making their, uh, it, it more difficult for them to reach their development goals in terms of providing reliable electricity access uh, and so on. And, and we need to double down and redouble our efforts to scale up uh, renewables and distributed uh, renewable energy supply to continue to make progress on energy access uh, rather than seeing a reversal for populations that are uh, vulnerable to climate change and very badly need uh, electricity supply to support their um, uh, economic opportunities. Um, we also need to be aware that for some, for some very important parts of the private sector, it can be difficult to demonstrate full alignment with the private sector to f have the data available and to be able to, uh, to, to, be able to uh, comply with the expectations that we have. The WWF president uh, mentioned the challenges in agricultural supply chains and for smallholder farmers, which I, which I think is a crucial area, but we also see for small and me medium-sized enterprises that there can be significant challenges and that they will need uh, a lot of support to succeed uh, in, in the transforming uh, economy that we are trying to support. Um, and it's very much the same. We need to double down uh, with strong frameworks to promote um, um, gender equality and, and gender smart investments uh, as well, as was mentioned by, by pre tv before. I would, I would like just to finish by making an appeal to all of us as partners to, uh, at the systemic level, also be aware that we are, uh, have become very uh, proficient at, uh, and we have seen a lot of progress at developing frameworks uh, to promote uh, climate-linked and, and uh, sustainable finance. But we are in some sense lagging behind on our impact uh, metrics uh, for a range of socioeconomic factors that are equally crucial to not, uh, not leaving important groups behind when it comes to employment and decent work, promoting gender equality, and providing essential services for underserved groups. And uh, it's crucial that we all commit ourselves as institutions to promote global, generally accepted uh, impact reporting standards also in these areas. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Andresen. Uh, to close the panel, I welcome Jean-Jacques Barberi, Executive Board Member and Head of Institutional and Corporate Clients Coverage of Amundi. Amundi has a long experience in partnering with uh, development banks and it has joined the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative to support the goal of net zero emissions by 2050. Uh, so based on your experience, uh, what hinders institutional investors from investing more in, in, in low and middle income countries and what are the pros and cons? Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure being with you. Thanks a lot for the invitation. I, I share a lot uh, of the different things uh, that have been mentioned already. Uh, maybe two reactions. Are, well, first, I, I would agree a lot on the fact that at the moment, uh, impact finance remains an island into a notion of finance that is not dedicated to impact anymore. And I think it's important to be conscious of it first. And second, uh, I think another element to share is that at the moment, the good news is that for investors that do care about the impact of their investments, I think they are all conscious of the fact that most of the impact that can be generated will be in emerging countries. Uh, and therefore, uh, this is uh, probably a very good news for the deployment of capital in these countries uh, to achieve our common objectives. This being said, if, if I can give the testimony of a practitioner uh, on what hinders the institutional investors. Well, I think first, and sorry for the short-termism of the financial industry from time to time, but I think we need to be conscious of the fact that we are entering into a moment
concerns where inflation concerns in a number of emerging countries will be an issue for investors uh, in the coming month. I think we need to be conscious of it. Uh, it's important. This may, might be something that may hinder investment decisions. Uh, so I think it's important to be conscious of that. More structurally, in the midterm, uh, I would say perspective, uh, I think, as it has been mentioned, of course, the returns are higher uh, in these countries in comparison uh, to the developed ones, particularly uh, in Europe, where we're living in a world of administrative rates uh, that are do not generating anything. Uh, this being said, this is also associated with some risks uh, that we know uh, we also need to be conscious of. Uh, and from time to time, I think the thing that hinders the most the capacity of investors to act is their governance themselves. They need to convince their governance that there is uh, an interest to deploy capital there uh, and uh, that I would say uh, the risk uh, is uh, limited in by a way or, or another. The second element that may hinder uh, the capacity to deploy more capital uh, in sustainable finance in emerging countries uh, might be a question of capacities, uh, capacities both from the inv institutional investors themselves, you need to know about what to do uh, in, uh, in these countries, uh, and also uh, to have the, I would say, associated ecosystem in the respective countries. I've given, I'll give you an example. Uh, when you're looking for a, a third party uh, independent entity to validate uh, what is uh, the uh, strategy behind a green bond in an emerging country, you need to find it on the ground and to have a credible partner there. So I think we need to have also the local capacities. So our experience uh, is that to deploy more capital uh, in uh, these countries and to achieve our common goals uh, is that uh, the private-public partnerships are extremely useful. Uh, we have a number of experience uh, with the World Bank, with the EIB on that front. Why? Because uh, public money can be used to de-risk partially uh, the institutional investors. Uh, I would say, therefore, uh, giving the capacity for a CFO uh, within a pension fund to convince its governance that it's the right thing to do uh, and that the risk profile that he's going to face is going to be appropriate one. Uh, so I think we think this is, very pr this is something that works. Second thing that works is to always try to attack the two, I would say, sides uh, of the coin at the same time, both the demand and the offer. What we think has been extremely su successful is working, for instance, with the World Bank on technical assistance facilities that helps, for instance, emerging banks to issue green bonds in uh, their local countries. Uh, and we think if you, if you can showcase that there is a pot of money to be invested that have been gathered by institutional investors and there is a facility to make sure that there will be the deployment afterwards, this is very powerful and it works, I think, extremely well. And finally, why we believe these type of mechanisms are useful, because, uh, it, because IFIs are most of the time extremely demanding when it comes to reporting and impact reporting uh, in particular, uh, and institutional investors are also extremely sensitive to it, uh, and therefore it's a right way as well to make sure that we deploy money properly with the, I would say, associated impact. So just a, a testimony of a practitioner. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, and thank all to all our speakers and the European Commission for promoting this interesting session. Um, at this point, I uh, leave uh, the closing remarks to Cohen Doens, Director General of the Department of International Partnership at the European Commission. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope you can all uh, hear and see me. Um, and indeed, I'm, I'm left with the uh, enviable task to, uh, to conclude uh, this, uh, this high level event. Um, I mean, unsurprisingly, I think I, I found it extremely uh, rich and, and concrete, um, which uh, I mean, is, is normal, I think, given the, the level of, uh, of players uh, we have around the table. Um, what I noted is, is first of all uh, a clear agreement on the premise we started from, which is that um, public finance alone obviously will not be sufficient uh, to, to support the global green resilient and just uh, recovery and transition that we're talking about, uh, let alone the achievement of the, the sustainable development goals and the Paris uh, Agreement objectives. So it's, it's not with public finance alone that we'll do it. Um, and, and therefore uh, the whole agenda on sustainable finance has a, has a key role uh, to play. Um, I, I also clearly noted um, a recognition of the fact that scaling up sustainable finance globally um, remains really challenging. Uh, and, and that's particularly true uh, for low and, and middle income countries. 
and, and it seemed that we all agree that much more needs to be done uh, to mobilize the needed finance uh, to the achievement of the of the SDGs in a way that leaves uh, no one and, and no country behind. Uh, the third point I noted is that, um, I mean, this challenge basically is further um, compacted, uh, made even more difficult by by the additional challenge that of course, um, we, 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 we need to adjust. It's not just about money. It's, it's fundamentally about really an adjustment of policies in order to make our societies and um, economy sustainable. So the, the fact that it's not just about policy reform, but also money, or that it's not just about money, but also policy reforms, makes this, of course, um, um, a, a huge task uh, that we have ahead of us. Um, I mean, as, as the Commissioner Urtilainen said, I think uh, we at the European Commission are really strongly committed to this agenda and, and certainly with the instruments we have at our disposal, uh, our new Global Europe instrument, um, we want to play a role, um, both in supporting our partners to, to operate these policy shifts uh, that are needed, and I mean a clear reference was made to the whole agricultural sector, energy transition and so on. So we're certainly there for that, but also to, to use our instrument to mobilize additional resources by crowding in private sector um, capital for sustainable development. And several of you uh, have referred to the European Fund for Sustainable Development Plus, our EFSD uh, Plus. Uh, we should stop using these acronyms, which probably nobody understands, uh, but the the guarantee and the blending potential that we have in the new instrument has been sincere, since, I mean, sensibly um, beefed up compared to the previous um, uh, budget we, we have. And so if we then combine this with the work we are doing with our own member states, with our European development institutions in a, in a Team Europe approach, I think Europe will certainly be a, a, a key partner, a strong partner on this um, agenda. So all in all, what I what I take away from, from having listened to you is still a certain sense of optimism in the sense that, um, I mean, but then optimism in the sense that if we work hard, we can actually, uh, we, we can actually succeed uh, because we do have the, the analysis of what needs to be done. We do have the, the ideas, uh, we do have the technology, and ultimately we also have uh, the, the resources. Um, and as, as several of you have said, and also, also Jean-Jacques, there is an appetite uh, there to, to move in that direction. Uh, and I think that the private sector, private capital clearly sees it uh, like that as well. So we do have the right cards in, in our hands, but the key challenge therefore is now how we, how we can play, be, best play those uh, cards um, in, in what is obviously a very complex and, and multidimensional environment where I think um, and we've heard it today again, uh, many objective and subjective dynamics uh, are at play. So it will require, I think, continued huge efforts from, from all of us, uh, from all stakeholders, um, country authorities, regulators, uh, private sector, CSOs, public and private donors, and then the national and multilateral development finance institutions. So it's an exciting uh, agenda, I think. Uh, it's not a new one. Uh, but it remains as exciting as, uh, as ever. Um, and um, I think simply we, we don't have another choice um, but to continue pursuing this um, in more and more detail with a, with a more and more uh, substantial mobilization of tools um, so that we can indeed collectively deliver on the um, SDG. So I want to thank you all um, for being part of this panel, uh, for sharing your, uh, your uh, valuable insights um, also to the moderator uh, for the good timekeeping. And I'm certainly looking forward to continued engagement with, uh, with all of you um, on making this agenda happen. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mr. Doens, for your final remarks. Uh, and thank you all for joining us in this session led by the European Commission. It's now time to move to room number one, where the leaders' dialogue is due to start. Thank you.